This is a lecture on Edward Said's book, Freud and the Non-European. This is Freud's, uh, a text on Freud's Moses and Monotheism and Edward Said's response to it. Now, like uh, Freud's mono, uh, Moses and Monotheism, Edward Said's Freud and the Non-European was one of the last things that he wrote. And so that has this sort of strange uh, commonality between these texts. And I should say that uh, Said's Freud and the Non-European was every bit as controversial as Freud's Moses and Monotheism. In fact, Said was originally scheduled to give this talk at the Vienna Inst at the Freud Institute in Vienna, and uh, it was banned. His talk was banned, and so instead he was invited as an alternative to give the same talk at the Freud House in London, which he did. So both Freud and Said were, were controversial figures in their own lifetime. And of course, uh, Sigmund Freud, Jewish man who lived most of his adult life in Vienna, although he died in London, where he wrote the conclusion to Moses and monotheism. And uh, Edward Said was a Palestinian Arab man who is responding as, as, a, uh, as a man whose family was displaced by the founding of the modern day state of Israel. And so he's a, 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 a Palestinian Arab who is responding to a, a Jewish uh, man's views on Moses. Although we should note that Said, although he is perhaps one of the most famous figures from the Arab world was not a Muslim, but was a Christian. So he was a Palestinian Christian who lived most of his adult life in the United States. And he found Freud's work on Moses and monotheism to be a, a very compelling and interesting work. And he he's responding to it. And that's what we're going to look at in this lecture. Now, I should I should note that the list lecture, again, is intended for those who um, are, are new to many of these ideas and are, you know, reading Freud and Said for the first time. And so this is a, essentially a, a basic overview of these ideas rather than a, a complex theoretical analysis of what each figure is doing. We're merely trying to identify what the key features are in Said's argument about Freud's book, Moses and Monotheism. And he's responding to Freud as somebody who himself is, is a non-European, but an Arab Palestinian man. Now, uh, as you can see, Edward Said lived from 1935 to 2003. He was an enormously influential figure, one of the founding figures of post-colonial uh, literary theory and studies in the United States. His landmark work was Orientalism, which is what he's still most famous for. It's published in 19. 78. He also wrote uh, a very influential book entitled The Question of Palestine, published in 1981, which gives his views on the Palestinian question, cultural imperialism. And then in 1999, he published a memoir entitled Out of Place, which is a more personal autobiographical narrative account of his life. Now, he wrote many, many other things, but these are some of the works that he's uh, best known for. Moses and uh, his, his book on Moses and monotheism, Freud and the non-European is a relatively short work compared to his other works and was essentially, again, a, a public talk that he gave once again on Freud's uh, Moses and monotheism. But also, not, let's note in passing that Moses and monotheism was, uh, was also a reprisal of many of the arguments first set forth in Totem and Taboo in 1913, and Freud revisits them in part three of this um, controversial work. Now, again, I have a lecture on the same website on parts one and two of Freud's Moses and Monotheism. And I also have two lectures on Totem and Taboo, which you can find as well, which also include significant passages from part three of uh, Moses and Monotheism. Uh, although the lecture that I have on Freud's Moses and Monotheism is strictly focused on parts one and two, but I invite you to have a look at those if you're wanting uh, more information about this material. But here we're going to look at Said's response, uh, Freud and the Non-European, again published in 2003, which was the same year that uh, Edward Said died. And again, there you can see an image of the Freud House in London 
where he gave this talk, which was too controversial to be uh, presented in, in Vienna. So uh, many of these ideas that we find here today are still quite controversial. And our, our goal here is, as with the lecture on Freud's Moses and monotheism, is not to promote any particular perspective on either of these texts, but merely to just simply come to terms with what the actual arguments are, what the ideas are in these texts. The goal here is to help students who are coming to this material for the first time to, uh, to, to get a grasp on what they are, what, what the ideas are through doing a careful, close reading of some, of some of the key passages. Now, I would note too, at the conclusion of this book, Freud and the Non-European, there is a response from a Jewish theorist named Jacqueline Rose. She's still alive. She's born in 1949, as you can see. And uh, she also wrote a book called The Question of Zion, which was a dialogical response to Said's The Question of Palestine, published in 2004. Now, unfortunately, uh, Said, uh, she gave, uh, she actually gave him a copy of this book, but he, he died very shortly thereafter. So we don't know what his uh, response to that text might have been. But it's very interesting that at the end you get, so you get this very nice dialogue that emerges between Jacqueline Rose and Edward Said at the conclusion. And so if you would like to hear a Jewish response to what Said is saying in his, uh, his uh, talk on Freud and the non-European, you can find it at the back of the book from uh, Jacqueline Rose. Now, I've also myself written a more detailed uh, uh, analysis of the Jacqueline Rose Edward Said exchange, which includes discussion of, uh, of Jacqueline Rose's uh, The Question of Zion in an article entitled Zionism Without Zionism in Arena Journal back in 2007. This is a journal where I'm one of the contributing editors for, and I'm not going to be dealing with this here. We won't be addressing Jacqueline Rose's response to Said because it would be, it would require a whole nother lecture in its own right. We don't really have time for that, but I just, I just want to mention this in passing. If you want more information about the Rose Said exchange, this is one place that you might go for it. Okay, now as we get started in our discussion of uh, Said's uh, analysis of Freud's Moses and monotheism, I want to also note Said posthumously published a book entitled On Late Style. This was published in 2007 or about four years after Said's death. And uh, it's a very interesting text uh, that, he, uh, that, that he wrote, and, and, and he alludes to this notion of what he calls late style in his book on Freud's Mo uh, Moses and monotheism. And, and late style refers to a style that develops, whether we're talking about a musical composer like, say, Beethoven or a writer like Sigmund Freud or, or Edward Said, it's a style of writing that emerges uh, for Said, as he argues, later in the life of an artist or composer or critic, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and oftentimes it's a kind of a um, not very welcoming uh, form of writing. The writer or the composer, say in the case of Beethoven, seems to be responding to his own questions and returning to his own themes that he's obsessively explored over the years or she's excessively explored. And, and, and uh, you know, Said is going to see uh, Freud's Moses and monotheism, particularly part three, as being or I would argue anyway that part three is, this is certainly more true of part three, that it's, it, it's characteristic of this very idiosyncratic and, and even difficult and unaccessible style of writing. And I, and I will go further than that and say that Said's own text here, uh, Freud and the non-European, would be characteristic of, of what Said is calling late style. And so, uh, one of the problems with this text, Freud and the Non-European, for for the kind for, for readers like those whom I'm speaking to now and addressing or coming to this material for the first time, is that it can be very overwhelming because the argument can be so dense, the illusions very thick. There's not much of an effort to welcome newcomers to the issues that are being raised. And so I just want to begin by acknowledging I'm I'm very aware that this is a very difficult text particularly for, let's say, undergraduates and new, newcomers to these ideas. 
Um, and that's one of the reasons why I want to uh, kind of take it slow and go through some of these key passages. Now, there's, this is a very dense and rich text, Said's book on Freud, and so we can't go into every dimension of it. But, so my goal here is a very simple goal. We're just going to try to identify you know, what's the main thrust of this argument by picking out a few key passages so that even though if we cannot address every dimension of what's laid out here, that you'll walk away, you know, with the feeling like you got you got the, the, the gist of it, got the essence of it, and, and you understand what's going on. Uh, but again, I, 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 I just want to say that I, uh, particularly for those of you who are, you know, in, in, in the class that I'm teaching related to this text, I, I sympathize with the difficulties that it has. I would just say be patient with it. And I hope that this lecture will help you to come to terms with um, the ideas that are, laid, that are laid out in this late style, as, as uh, Said calls it, and I would say is characteristic of this text as well. Right. Here's what Said says about late style in Freud and the non European. He says, anyone with an interest in what has been called late style will find Freud's Moses and monotheism an almost classic example, like the bristlingly difficult works that Beethoven produced in the last seven or eight years of his life. Moses seems to be composed by Freud for himself with scant attention to frequent and often ungainly repetition or regard for elegant economy of prose and exposition. Everything about the work suggests not resolution and reconciliation, but rather more complexity and a willingness to let un irreconcilable elements of the work remain as they are, episodic, fragmentary, unfinished, unpolished. Well, now, uh, whether or not this is true of Freud's Moses and monotheism, as Said suggests here, I think it's certainly true of Freud, of Said's Freud and the non-European. And so it's, 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 not a, it's not a warm and fuzzy text, but it's, there's a lot of really important ideas here in Said's essay. So that's why I want to take some time and, uh, and, and carefully unpack them. Now, I would, I'll note, too, in passing, Said was a, a music critic, and he, was, he, he loved classical music, as do many Palestinian people. There's a great love for classical music in, in Palestine. And Said was, uh, uh, you know, he wrote himself, uh, 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 you know, critic uh, criticisms of performances at the Met in New York. It's all where he lived, you know, in Columbia, Manhattan area. And so uh, he's a lot of uh, Said's works uh, have references to classical composers. Okay, now let's put, I want to put Said's work on Freud and the non-European into a particular context, which is to say Freud's book, Moses and Monotheism, has spawned a lot of criticism, a lot of analysis, uh, a lot of different critics have given their views on what's going on in this text. And I can, we can't go through all of them here, but I just want to mention two really key texts, particularly uh, uh, Yerushalmi's Freud's Moses, because Said is going to do, perform a brief analysis of this text in the pages of uh, Freud and the non-European himself. Also, Derrida in Archive Fever has a much more extended analysis of Yerushalmi's Freud's Moses, but also Peter Gay's The God a Godless Jew. Now, I, I picked these two texts out as representative of trends that there are in the re historical reception of Freud's book, uh, Moses and Monotheism. And one, let's, we'll call, putting in quotes here, the Jewish Freud. And this is the Yerushalmi's Freud's Moses. Now, Yerushalmi is himself Jewish, and he's very anxious to recuperate a, a, a Jewish Freud. And, and, a, and he sees in Moses and Monotheism, he sees in it, in effect, a kind of a Freud's sort of, as, as a very old man, as the last book that he wrote, as a kind of a return to the fold or a return to the religion or the spiritual tradition of his youth. And so he, he, it's, a, it's a very uh, complex and interesting analysis, but it's one that has a very particular thesis or ax to grind, and that is to show that Freud is, is a Jewish uh, thinker, right? Now, this is, of course, the same argument that the National Socialist Party had as well. This is why Freud was driven out of Vienna and into London was because psychoanalysis was seen as, as a Jewish science. And so one thing we could say perhaps about Yerushalmi's approach is that he may agree that it's a Jewish science, but it's just that for Yerushalmi, that's not necessarily a stigmatized 
way of thinking about what Freud's doing, but something that he wants to recuperate and celebrate. Now, by contrast, Peter Gay is a godless Jew is, um, you know, this, this presents the argument for what I'm calling the enlightenment Freud. And again, I'm not using either one of these terms in a pejorative or stigmatized way, just merely descriptive sense, because Gay is going to want to, um, you know, insist that Freud was a thinker in the rational uh, enlightenment, rationalist enlightenment tradition and who firmly repudiated the religion, his father's religion, Judaism, and, and was himself a, a godless Jew or a staunch uh, atheist. Now, uh, Saeed doesn't go deeply into the question of was Freud an atheist or not, but I, one thing that we can say is that in some sense, the, the, that Freud, uh, Saeed presents us his work on Freud with a rebuttal to uh, Freud's Moses by Yerushalmi, and also I would argue Derrida's Archive Fever by by following this this tradition, which is really more representative of the kind of interpretation of Freud that we find in Peter Gay's The Godless Jew. That is, Saeed's going to be more interested in seeing uh, Freud as as a humanist or neo humanist thinker and, and an Enlightenment thinker, and he's going to ask questions about, is it really true that, that uh, as Yerushalmi makes Freud out to be, that he's really uh, sort of returning to the fold, so to speak, to put it in perhaps oversimplified terms. So in any case, this is what's in the backdrop, this history of this, the reception of, of Freud's work in the dialogue that has arisen around Moses and monotheism and the way in which Said is making a contribution, uh, his book, uh, Freud and the non-European constitutes a contribution to this discussion that is taking place around Freud's controversial thesis about Moses' Egyptian, possible Egyptian uh, origin. Here's Said. He says, reading Moses and monotheism, one is struck by Freud's almost casual assumption that Semites were most certainly not European and at the same time were somehow assimilable to its culture as former outsiders. This is quite different from theories about Semites propounded by Orientalists like Renan, whom he writes, side writes about a great length in Orientalism, and racial thinkers such as Gabino and Wagner, who underlined the foreignness and excludability of Jews, as well as Arabs for that matter, to Greco-Germanic Aryan culture. Freud's views of Moses as both insider and outsider is extraordinarily interesting and challenging. I believe it is true to say that Freud's was a Eurocentric view of culture, and why should it not be? Okay, so here we see Freud or Said essentially lining up with this argument set forth by Gaze. He says, "Look, you know, we got to be careful about, you know, you know, we, you know, you have to look at Freud's work in the context of the trajectory of all the many, many works that he wrote, which advocated a more, you know, atheistic enlightenment perspective, empirical. Freud thought of himself as an empiricist, empirical uh, scientist. And, uh, and he's going to see, you know, Freud as being, uh, having a much more, you know, complex sense of what it means to be a Jew, the say than we find in, in the theory of somebody like Yerushalmi. But now I want to mention in passing, uh, Saeed is alluding here to, to Gobineau's book, uh, Essay on the Inequality of Human Races. Gobineau lived from 1816 to 1882, and he was a real, uh, well, you know, it's hard to say anything very positive about him. Uh, you know, he, he was one of the figure, main figures who laid down a theory of, of, of racial essentialism. He was, he was a racist, in effect. And so what, what Saeed is really saying here is that, you know, if you look at, you know, I think at one point Said calls the 19th century the golden age of racism. It was the age where, you know, race, racial essentialist theories were really prevalent. It was also not coincidentally the apex of the colonial imperial uh, era. So many of these kinds of theories of race, like those articulated by Gobineau, were articulated in order to provide a kind of a theoretical philosophical justification for imperialist exploitation. Now, to say that Gobineau was an essentialist on matters of race is to say that he believed that there were very distinct racial, uh, you know, types or categories of people. And that, in, in that sense, we can think of, say, a person who was somatic uh, uh, as being as different from a person, say, who was Aryan 
or European, uh, almost uh, in the fact two, two different species. And so he would have, for instance, racialist, racial essentialists like Gobineau were very against uh, interracial marrying or miscegenation. And so what, if we go back and look at this quote now in that light, I mean, what, what uh, Said is saying is that, you know, although the thought of thinkers like Gobineau were very prominent at this time, this is not what we find in Freud. We find in Freud, uh, you know, so, a, a quite different view, a, a quite a, a much more complex view that, you know, unlike Gobineau and Renan, who would uh, uh, underline the foreignness and excludability of Jews, uh, Freud sees their identity as being, you know, very, you know, interesting in the sense that it's both an inside and outside, and certainly not essentialist. And this is uh, in, in the way that Gobineau is going to suggest. So, and this is the, the main point that Said's going to come back to in this essay, is that whatever it means to be a Jew, or to say to be an Arab by way of contrast, um, it, it oftentimes is a lot more complex than we might imagine, and it certainly we, we certainly want to be careful about embracing uh, essentialist uh, notions of racial identity. And, and, he's, and he's going to suggest here that this is what Freud is doing too. Okay, so let's let's uh, let, let's see how Said responds directly to Yerushalmi's Freud and Moses. He says Freud repeats over and over that although he was a Jew. He did not believe in God, and only in the most minimal way could he could be said to have any religious sense at all. Now, Yerushalmi shrewdly points out that Freud seemed to have believed, perhaps following Lamarck, that the character traits embedded in the Jewish psyche are themselves transmitted phylogenetically and no longer require religion in order to be sustained. On such a final Lamarckian assumption, even godless Jews like Freud inevitably inherit and share them. So far, so good. But then Yerushalmi goes on to ascribe a kind of almost desperately providential leap to Freud that I find largely unwarranted. Okay, before we go and look at this leap that Freud's talking about that Yerushalmi makes in his uh, analysis, let me just say, you know, briefly again, Lamarck. Now, Lamarck, like Darwin, was a theory of evolution. You might, an easy way to kind of remember this is think of like, you know, theories of, of evolution in, in spurts, like, uh, you know, a giraffe that can, you know, generationally just make, you know, grow instead of natural selection, like we find in Darwin, we find these sort of extraordinary events that occur that, that enable evolutionary change. And so while Lamarck was a uh, evolutionary thinker uh, like Darwin. He, he was not a thinker of natural selection like Darwin. And so he's saying, you know, you know, Freud, you know, and, and, and I, I can't go into this here. It's a very complex argument. I do go into it more in lectures I have on this website about totem and taboo, the two lectures that are there. So if you're interested in that, you can go look at it. But, but very briefly, Freud does say in uh, Moses and monotheism, and, you know, he, he does sort of veer uncharacteristically towards this possibility that um, that, that traits in, you know, in, in the Jewish psyche may have been transmitted, you know, genetically speaking, there may be something very like, for instance, even in, in the DNA, in our DNA that gets passed down generationally. You don't find Freud making that argument in many other places. Most of the time, his views are quite empirical and external, almost uh, Darwinian in effect, rather than Lamarckian. But you do find that in towards the conclusion of uh, mono, Moses and monotheism. And, and uh, Said is acknowledging that. He's not saying, he's, you know, it's there. Yerushalmi makes a big deal about it because it does underscore uh, that, that there may have been something in Freud's argument that affirmed that he was perhaps more Jewish than he acknowledged in, in his more empirical uh, gra empirically grounded moments. But then, uh, so Said acknowledges that, but then he says, but then Yerushalmi makes a leap that Said finds problematic. He says, if monotheism, Yerushalmi says, was genetically Egyptian, it has been historically Jewish. And then he adds, quoting Freud, that it is honor enough for Jewish people, the Jewish people that it has kept alive such a tradition and produced men who lent it their voice, even if the stimulus had first come to uh, first come from the outside from a great stranger. Okay, now here's what Said says. He says Yerushalmi has jumped to conclusions 
about what is historically Jewish that Freud himself doesn't actually reach because the actual Jewishness that derives from Moses is a far from open and shut matter. And it is in fact, extremely problematic. Freud is resolutely, resolutely divided about it. Freud's opening sentence of Moses and monotheism is a celebration of what he has done and will do in the pages to follow, which is nothing less than to quote, deny a people, the man, whom is, uh, whom is praised as the greatest of its sons, Moses. He then goes on to say that a feat of this kind cannot be entered into gladly or carelessly, especially by one belonging to that people. Okay, so in effect, uh, you know, Said is, is, you know, reminding us that, you know, that Freud himself begins this text, Moses and Monotheism, by stating very explicitly that he is that it is his intent to deny the Jewish people of, of to which to whom he belongs the the Jewish identity of its you know greatest prophet Moses, and he says he's not going into this uh, just in, in any sort of you know flippant way because he himself is Jewish. But but so what 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 Said is doing is he's he's making us a little bit more aware of, of Yerushalmi's eagerness to construct a Jewish Freud. And uh, Said is not saying that Freud was not Jewish, but he's saying that, that Freud's understanding of what it meant to be Jewish is certainly not essentialist in the way that Gobineau's was. Uh, and, and it's far more complex than someone like Yerushalmi is willing to acknowledge. Jewish identity, in effect, is, is, a, is a complex question, a complex historical question. And he's also, Said is also going to see in Yerushalmi's denial of the, you know, complexity of Jewish identity. He's going to see that echoed in very particular political policies enacted in the modern day state of Israel that wants, like Yerushalmi, to create a very, uh, a very sort of sealed off uh, irreducible notion of Jewish identity that, that Freud in Moses and monotheism is calling into question. Okay, so why does he do it? Well, so he says Freud does this in the interest of truth, and he says this very explicitly. He says he's not uh, going, he's not interested in questions of national interest. Let's read, so he says he minces no words at all, far more important than what we are supposed to be, that what are supposed to be national interests. Now this is that opening, that opening paragraph. This is Freud's allusion to uh, Jewish nationalism or Zionism that he's, that his, in other words, Said is really pointing out here that Freud's commitments are to truth, you know, reason, not, you know, supposed national interests. And Freud says this in such a way that it's that it's almost he almost says it in a very blunt, rude way, and so to make a Freud uh, a uh, let's say a uh, a closet uh, Zionist would be problematic from Said's perspective. Okay, so here here's what Said says. He says the sarcasm in this last phrase of Freud's fairly takes your breath away, as much for its arrogance as for its willingness to subordinate the interests of a whole people to what is more important, okay, what, what Freud is calling the truth. The truth is more important than the interests of the Jewish nation is one way to say that for Freud. The removal of a religion source from its place inside the community and history of like-minded believers. Okay, so this, this would certainly seem from, if we were to look at Said, what Said is saying is that his interpretation of Freud much more lines up with Peter Gay's in that insofar as he's, he's really underscoring that Freud is, is, is a rational enlightenment thinker. And that's what, his, that's where his interests lie, not in, uh, in, in promoting any particular national interests or ethnic or religious uh, identity or ideology. First, Said says, Moses's Egyptian identity for Freud and his ideas about a single God are derived from the Egyptian Pharaoh who is universally credited with the invention of monotheism by Freud. Okay, so for Freud, it's very clear that the inventor, uh, inventor of monotheism was Akhenaten and no one other than Akhenaten. Unlike Yerushalmi, Freud goes out of his way to credit Akhenaten 
with this idea. Yerushalmi is far more anxious than Freud to scrape away traces of monotheism from Egypt after Akhenaten's death, and he implies that it was the genius of Judaism to have elaborated the religion well beyond anything the Egyptians knew about. Now, again, I, I'm not, I don't want to suggest here who's right or wrong, but I want to put this in context. And, and what Saeed is saying would be very characteristic for, it would be a view that I think would be very characteristic of many uh, Arab commentators, whether one was, uh, you know, Christian or Muslim, Christian in the case of Saeed, but vast majority of Arab people in the Middle East are, uh, are, are Muslim. And, and from the Arab Islamic perspective, the idea that, Jewish people would have a monopoly on, Muda on um, monotheism would be uh, simply uh, not accepted. I mean, certainly from from the uh, Islamic perspective. And so we, I think we can also place what Said is saying here within the framework of a kind of a pan-Arab consciousness that include that even though Said is not Islamic, includes a, a, a significant, um, you know, is, is Islam as a point of reference. And, uh, and and also, of course, obviously, uh, Egypt as well, which is from, from where monotheism uh, emanates in, in a way that for Said is far more virulent than Yerushalmi is, is willing to acknowledge. Okay, and here's what Said says about Freud. He says, Freud is more complex and even contradictory than, say, Yerushalmi. He grants that the Jews eliminated sun worship from the religion they took over from Akhenaten, but further undercuts Judaic originality by noting that A, circumcision was an Egyptian, not a Hebrew idea, which, you know, if you're, if you're looking at it strictly from a biblical perspective, you might even find this like an orthodox biblical perspective, whether you're, I mean, you could even say this could be true of a Muslim reader as well, and a Christian as well as a Jewish reader could be quite shocking to think of circumcision as being historically not originating with the Abrahamic covenant, but being far older than that. But we know, whatever one's religious views, we know historically that that's simply uh, the, 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 fact, the historical fact, that it does come from Egypt. And B, that the Levites, surely as Judaic a group, as convention says, ever existed, were Moses's Egyptian followers who had come with them to the new place. Now, this is, again, the argument in Moses and monotheism that the Levites, the set-aside priestly caste, were part of the retinue of Moses and they too would have been Egyptian. And so it's not just then Moses that has an Egyptian identity, but this whole very prominent caste of, of, of Jews, historically speaking, the Levites also would have this kind of uh, Egyptian origin in, in uh, Freud's reading. And this is something that is, uh, uh, you know, is, is, is kind of uh, rushed over in Yerushalmi's eagerness to paint us an image of a Jewish Freud. So again, here, here you can see these, you know, images there on, on, on the right, you see the Abraham, the, the, the biblical book of Genesis, which assigns the covenant to this, or the act of circumcision as a, as a seal of the covenant to, uh, to Abraham when he makes his covenant with God. But again, we see images from ancient Egypt, which far predate any of the Abrahamic traditions. So we just, we know historically that uh, whatever whatever one thinks about circumcision it does it is far older than the Abrahamic traditions and this is something that both Said and Freud are underscoring okay so who are the Jews for Freud according to uh, Edward Said uh, what Said's going to want to really and this is I think what the main thrust here this is a difficult text it's very complex in the slate style as I said but 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 this is the point that Said continues to come back on over and over again is that is that for Freud what it means to be Jewish is, is, a, is a question that is insistently complex and discontinuous far more so than current views on this question not just in the text of Yerushalmi or say a racial essentialist like Gobino but in Israel today which wants to promote a narrow and exclusive idea uh, of, of Judaism that, that excludes the, uh, the non-European from it. Like in this case, in this particular case, i.e. we could think then of the non-European quite specifically what Said has in mind is the Palestinian, the Palestinian like himself. And so he's really writing about Freud 
and people like himself, Palestinians. But 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 the term is obviously more inclusive than that. But in but the in the particular case of Said, he's interested in it from the Palestinian perspective because this history has affected Palestinian people so dramatically. So uh, Said's going to say that Freud's Egyptian Moses is a figure of this insistently complex and discontinuous identity. And this is what Said's going to keep coming back to. It's he's saying, look, it's more complicated than you think. There's not. It's not. It's, it's not just a matter of this person's a Jew, this person's not a Jew, this person's an Arab, this person's not an Arab. The questions of identity of this nature are, are often far more complex than we may uh, imagine, but we like, we, we would prefer to keep it simple, but it's not simple and Freud didn't want it to be simple. And this is Said's point that he's going to uh, insist upon. For Freud, writing and thinking in the mid-1930s, the actuality of the non-European was its constitutive presence as a sort of fissure or, or, or uh, a, a, something that is, is a break, a, a cut in the figure of Moses, founder of Judaism, but an unreconstructed non-Jewish Egyptian nonetheless. Uh, Jehovah, Je Jehovah Yahweh derived from Arabia which was also non-Jewish and non-European. Okay, so what, what he's really getting at here as, as a Palestinian Arab man, what he's saying, look, this is what Freud is saying, is that Jewish, you know, Jewish identity is founded on a non-European, non-Jewish basis. It comes, the, the, many of the most important aspects of what is considered to be a kind of what one might think of as a sort of an essentialist, Jewish identity don't even come from Judaism, but they come from Egypt and it comes from Arabia. And this is something that is, that is really not that uh, controversial or, pra or, or problematic from a, uh, from let's say a uh, Middle Eastern perspective, but I think it's important to remember. So let me, let me just underscore this as we're thinking about the question of circumcision and why Said's going to want to insist upon this question is that remember in the Arab world and in the African world, which is predominantly Muslim, all males, just about all males anyway, are circumcised. In Europe, historically speaking, Europeans were not circumcised, but Jews who lived in Europe were circumcised. And so in the case of Europe, circumcision was something that set Jews apart from Europeans. And so it became a marker of their ethnic difference. But in the case of the uh, Middle East, Arab world, Africa, there's nothing particularly exceptional or remarkable about circumcision. Everybody's circumcised because it's a part of a, of a much larger, uh, you know, cultural heritage and, and history and it's, it's far older, again, as I said, than the Abrahamic traditions. And so there's nothing really exceptional about it. It's, it's certainly not a sign of, of difference in the way that it is in Europe. And so I think it's important then as we're thinking about, you know, the qu questions of Jewish identity, Arab identity. We think of Jewish identity in the European context, but it's very different to situate Jewish identity with respect to the question of circumcision in a context of a world where everybody is circumcised. And so that's, that's, uh, that's an important point uh, that, that I think Said is wanting to underscore that, you know, the question of what he's calling the trauma or the trace in this narrative or in this uh, theoretical analysis, I should say, is linked to the question of circumcision, which is also very important for Freud and for his theory of psychoanalysis. All right. So he says, I, I very much doubt that Freud imagined he would have non-European readers like himself, or that in the context of the struggle over Palestine, over Palestine, he would have Palestinian readers, but he did and he does. Said's one of them. And out of the travails of a specifically European anti-Semitism, the establishment of Israel in a non-European territory in Palestine consolidate a Jewish identity politically in a state that took very specific legal and political positions effectively to seal off that identity from anything that was non-Jewish. By defining itself as a state of and for the Jewish people, 
Israel allowed exclusive immigration and land owning rights there for Jews only, even though there were former non-Jewish residents and present non-Jewish residents living there. So this is a really important move here that Said is making in his essay, because like if we think if we think of the idea of what it means to be a Jew as presented in Yerushalmi's text, or let's say in a, in a, in a, in a straight up racist text like Go, we know these are sealed off uh, uh, articulations of what it means to be a Jew. And the 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 articulation of what it means to be a Jew in Freud is not sealed off. It's it's problematic. It's open. It's it's uh, it's 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 contradictory. It has unresolved issues embedded within it. And this is something that Said is saying precisely is not being allowed in the state of Israel with respect to the question of what it means to be a Jew or Jewish identity, which also becomes a kind of a sealed off, uh, uh, irreducible, uh, essentialist uh, identity standpoint position, which is which has particular kind of political uh, facts. And one of them is to exclude all those who don't fit into those very easy essentialist categories that are promulgated by the state. And they certainly have an impact on, let's say, Palestinian peoples. And so this is why Said is very interested in, in, in looking at how Freud presents this, this contradictory, complex image, historical image of Jewishness in Freud, which is very different than what he finds in the text of Yerushalmi. Now here's a map of Israel and the occupied territories. Today you can see Gaza, West Bank, Golan Heights. The, these three areas in green, these are the Palestinian territories, but they're under, particularly West Bank is under, uh, uh, you know, occupation, settler colonialism is an ongoing phenomenon there. But all of what you see in what is Israel proper was one was at one time Palestine. And it was, uh, remember the modern uh, day nation state of Israel, the Zionist movement, which came from Europe, from let's say you know many of many of whom were uh, victims of the Shoah or, or what's sometimes called the Holocaust, came into this area after World War II, and and it was a, a project which inevitably displaced the people that already were living there, and this is what um, this is what Said is pointing to, uh, you know these kind of sealed off identities, which, which remains a problem uh, today. And he's responding again as a Palestinian man. And he's linking what you know Freud is doing in this text, which Freud probably never would have dreamed would have happened to what is going on in, uh, in Israel and, and Palestine today. Said writes quite differently from the spirit of Freud's deliberately provocative reminders that Judaism's founder, Moses that is, was a non-Jew and that Judaism begins in the spirit of Freud's deliberately provocative reminders that Judaism's founder was a non-Jew, and that Judaism begins in the realm of Egyptian non-Jewish monotheism. Israeli le uh, legislation countervenes, represses, and even cancels Freud's carefully maintained opening out of Jewish identity towards its non-Jewish background. The complex layers of the past, so to speak, have been eliminated by the official by official Israel. Let me let me read that again. The complex layers of the past, so to speak, have been eliminated by official Israel. And this is what Said is seeking to restore to our understanding of Freud's text is this sense of complexity and all and, and, and this but he sees again in in this uh, in, in these kinds of simple readings of Freud's text something that he sees also being replicated in Israel today. Freud, by contrast, had left considerable room to accommodate Judaism's non-Jewish antecedents and contemporaries. And I think I am right in surmising that Freud mobilized the non-European past in order to undermine any, this is any underscore, that word any, doctrinal attempt that might be made to put Jewish identity on a sound foundational basis, whether religious or secular. Now, what Said is, is pointing out when he speaks of the sound foundational basis, he's saying that, that, you know, Freud was not an essentialist thinker. Freud did not want Jewish identity to assume a metaphysical character. Freud, in effect, to put it in more contemporary terms, was interested in deconstructing the metaphysical basis of 
uh, essentialist Jewish articulations of identity. And this is something that, that Freud, that, that Said himself is also going to affirm. Now Said is not obviously going to affirm a, an essentialist Arab concept of identity as well. He's going to de he's going to instead be interested in deconstructing the very idea of a metaphysical ground to any kind of identity, a housed identity that we may uh, assert. He's going to see Freud as perhaps being, we might think of Freud in this sense as a pre-deconstructive thinker in the reading that Said is, is promoting here. Okay, now early in, and we're, and we're coming to the conclusion of our analysis here. Again, we're not covering every aspect, but I do want to draw attention to uh, the, the, the finest moment in this text. And, and Henry Louis Gates Jr., for instance, has called Edward Said a critical fanonist, among others like Homi Baba and Spivak and so on. But um, there is a, an important reference to uh, Franz Fanon in the early pages of uh, Said's uh, Freud and the non-European. Now, um, can't get too far into that question today, but Fanon was one of the most important theorists of post-colonial movements and decolonization movements. His classic text, The Wretched of the Earth, was essentially a handbook for decolonization in the 1960s. And, uh, and Said is certainly writing within this, uh, within this tradition as a post-colonial writer interested in decolonization. Uh, Fanon was from Martinique, but he later became a citizen of Algeria and he died quite young of, of leukemia. Freud, uh, Said also died of leukemia as well. Um, here's Fanon from Wretched of the Earth. This is towards the conclusion. He says, let's leave this Europe where they are never done talking of man, yet murder men everywhere they find them at the corner of every one of their own streets and all the corners of the globe. Europe undertook the leadership of the world with ardor, cynicism, and violence. When I search for man in the technique and style of Europe, I, I, I see only a succession of... Uh, negations of man and an avalanche of murders. Okay, now I want to draw, this is, a, you know, Fanon was a very colorful writer. Uh, he used like, you know, like, like say Nietzsche or something who had very provocative sentences, which is why one of the reasons why he's so uh, influential. But um, what I want to draw attention to here is the question of what uh, Fanon is uh, uh, capitalizing here as man. So what he's really doing here is he's, he's attacking, it would seem to be he's attacking humanism, but he's really not because Fanon also speaks of what he calls a new man. And so what he's doing, what Fanon is really doing in the wretched of the earth is he's not, Fanon is not a post-humanist thinker. He's not an anti-humanist thinker. He, but he is deconstructing the European concept of the human or, or man which really is a very exclusive concept of man. Now, this is a theme that Said develops in great detail in Orientalism when he shows how, uh, you know, essentialist uh, non-European identities become inert objects to be acted upon by European man who has agency, but nobody else does. And that's a very fanonist idea as well. And so it's, but, but again, for Fanon, it's not a matter of throwing out humanism, throwing out the question of man, but of making, but, but, of, but of constructing a new humanism, a much more inclusive articulation of man or what it means to be a, a human than this European humanism that, that in theory and the idea praises the notion of the human or man, but then performs, you know, horrific acts, let's say, of, uh, in, in the colonial context specifically, like if we take, for instance, like as described in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, which, which incidentally was uh, the first book that, Fanon, that, excuse me, that Edward Said wrote was a study of uh, Joseph Conrad. And so, uh, so, so this, so, so Said is at one with Fanon in wanting to deconstruct the European concept of man, but without necessarily moving towards an anti-humanism but rather embracing a concept of the human that is more inclusive in terms of gender and, and uh, ethnic identity and so forth and so on. Um, here's, here's what Said says. He says, Freud's meditations and insistence on the, on the non-European from a Jewish point of view, meaning Freud's Jewish point of view, provide, I think, an admirable sketch of what it entails by way of refusing to resolve identity into some of the nationalist or religious herds in which so many people want so desperately to run. 
More bold is Freud's profound exemplification of the insight that even for the most definable, the most identifiable, the most stubborn communal identity, for him, this was the Jewish identity, there are inherent limits that prevent it from fully from being fully incorporated into one and only one identity. Now that is a really important passage in this text, and you should really focus in on that. It's his insight that you know even the most stubborn communal identity, when, and he's using the instance of Freud in Freud's case, Jewish identity, that there are limits. Uh, you know, this is again a, a, an attempt to open up the sealed off notion of identity and make it uh, less uh, exclusive. Uh, and, and, and he sees Freud at, as being at one with him in this project. Freud's symbol of those limits was that the founder of Jewish identity was himself a non-European Egyptian. In other words, identity cannot be thought or worked through itself alone, right? Uh, that would be to do so would be very Cartesian, like the sort of the self that's detached, you know, from the body and exists, you know, metaphysically in an independent sense. Uh, we all exist in relation to others. Or to put it in Heideggerian terms, being is being with others. There's no identity that's that's totally independent of its relation to others and to the other. The strength of this thought, Said says, is I believe that it can be articulated in and speak to other besieged identities as well. Uh, this would be, for instance, the Palestinian identity was one case, uh, not through dispensive palliative such as tolerance and compassion, but rather by attending to it as a troubling, disabling, secular wound, the essence of the cosmopolitan from which there can be no recovery, no state of resolved or stoic calm, and no utopian reconciliation even with itself. This was a necessary psychological experience. And I can't get too deep here in this context in the question of what he's calling here uh, this uh, this troubling, disabling, secular wound. But, you know, when we think of this idea of the wound, you know, I think this is, again, links us right back to the question of circumcision, the wound, which is also the trace, the grandma, the, the mark, the signature, to put it in, in uh, Derridian terms. It's a very key notion in much contemporary critical theory. And so it's why I think this is a, very, very important moment in this uh, text that, and I'm, I'm presenting these ideas for those who are new to them, but uh, new to these ideas, but, but if you're, you know, if you're uh, been, if you've been working in Said for a while and you, you know a bit about post-structuralist theory, I would suggest you to really focus a bit on what he's saying here because it's, it's very uh, significant. And so, but I'll, I'll, I'll sum it up here, try to keep this as uh, simple as possible for our, purposes for this lecture, and that is that, uh, you know, we're, if we are all human, uh, you know, what's significant is not, you know, sort of what he's called a palliative like tolerance. We just should just tolerate the other. No, he's saying that the base or have compassion for the other. Sure, we should have those things, but but the basis of what of our shared humanity is in effect what he's calling this secular wound. Now, a secular wound is very different from a particular wound the wound that is exclusive, like let's say in the case of a, of a tribal cut that, that gives me a name but also cuts me off from all others. This would be a wound that links me, the wound that Said is talking about, the secular wound is not a exclusive wound but a wound that links me to, to the human community. And what we all then share is, 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 is trauma. We, we, we've all, we all have, uh, everybody, all of us, whether we're, you know, survivors of the Shoah or whether we're displaced Palestinians or, you know, people who suffered racial discrimination, black people in the U.S., for instance, uh, you know, we all, what we all have in common is all of us have, uh, have experienced trauma. And this, this is, this is, is a basis for us to perhaps find commonality in, in our shared humanity. Now here is a picture of Said and uh, and Freud, and there's there's a lot more here that we could say. I mean, remember this is a very this is a very dense little essay, as, as I called it, late style by Freud. I think in some ways Said's book is more dense, more of the instance of the late style than Freud's work. Uh, but I've tried to just pick out the main 
points here as not as a uh, stopping point, but as an, as an entry into this essay. And so I hope these uh, issues that we've covered will help you gain access to the, to the basic, uh, basics, I should say, of what Said is arguing in this wonderful book, uh, Freud and the Non-European.